very quickly, 4D, this is where you link the scheduled data to model elements. Um, what you have to be very careful with is a couple of issues. When you start to connect the program to the model, the first thing you're going to identify is that the model is not the same as the program. What we've discovered with this 4D sequencing is the first thing you have to do is you have to agree on a work breakdown structure coding. So it only works if you have a work breakdown structure code that is in the program and in the model. And if it's not done that way, you, can't create, you cannot create 4D models in an easy manner. So you have to get the programmers or the planners to follow a work breakdown structure code. And then you have to get the modelers to model in the same way as that work breakdown structure code. Now, if it's concrete, that's easy. When it gets into things like facades, uh, architectural finishes, and into building services, it becomes immensely more complicated. The other issue is the planners don't like it because they have to put a lot more detail into their construction schedule, uh, which means they have to do more work. So it adds more value, but it adds more work. So it's a very, very powerful tool, but it does take a huge amount of work. So it needs to be done carefully. Um, you can use 4D at effectively three different ways. You can use it for tenders, which is what we see very often. So in the requirement in the example I gave you, you can use it for construction method statements. It's a very, very powerful way to understand a project and it's a very powerful way to pitch an idea to a client. So you can use, and all the major contractors do this on a regular basis, you can use 4D to sell your construction program. During the project, we use it for safety planning and overall site logistics. So we use it to manage the, the macro of the site we don't use it for the actual construction day-to-day -day activities. It's just, it's nearly impossible to keep up with. And you will see a lot of 4D modeling in claims. So there's a lot of people doing as planned versus as constructed or as built construction simulations. If you're standing in a courtroom and you're trying to explain to a judge who is non-technical what you plan to do and what you actually did and you want to show causation for delay or you want to show design change a visual 4d sequence is very very powerful so i've been involved with a number of these things and it's a very useful way of doing 4d bim it's not what the client wanted because then you're using bim against them but that's what happens so moving on to quantity takeoff, this one is an absolute minefield. It has not been done. It has not been achieved yet. It will get done, but we're not anywhere close. So the challenge with the quantity takeoff, they have to follow the same work breakdown structure. If there isn't a work breakdown structure, you can't do a proper quantity takeoff. So what we mean by that is you put in a work breakdown structure, so you identify all the different systems, and then you can start peeling them off and start putting prices against them. So in this case, you can take off widths, you can take off thicknesses, you can take off perimeters, you can take off volumes, and then you can start doing pricing. So if you think about a 5D BIM exercise, and I think we've got a few quantity surveyors in the group, you can use the model for quantity takeoff, but it will only give you 60 to 70% of the total bill. It is not going to give you 100% of the total cost plan. So be very wary of people saying, oh, I've done 5D and I can figure out the price of a building. They're they're smoking something that is probably illegal. So they can take out a certain amount of quantities, but not all of them. You can use the model takeoff as a validation. So what we find is the experienced surveyors, they will do a quantity takeoff and they will identify where things are not coded, coded correctly. They'll identify things that are not in the work breakdown structure. They'll identify duplicates. You'd be amazed how many times we find six doors where there should be one door. And it's a modeling software problem. So the architect places a door but unwittingly, they copy and paste it back into the same place four or five times. And we end up, uh, end up with a bill of quantities with six doors where you only need one. So it's, it's got to be on carefully. The same work breakdown structure can be used for the 4D simulation and 4D sequencing. And if you get really good, then you can start to consider trade packages, progress claims, asset data collection, and revisioning. But if you don't get the model validation and the work breakdown structure done correctly, you can't do squat. So it all starts off with planning the work breakdown structure at the design stage. If it's, if it's implemented at construction stage, it's too late, I'm sorry. And so this is an example of how we're using it. So we're using it for progress and revenue for major elements of work. So in our case, we're doing it for all the structural works. So we have a plan that we've signed off with our client and we have an actual that we're reporting against and we're tracking that against the actual major work. So you can see we're doing an overall progress. We've got site preps, prelims, retaining wall structures, excavation, RC structures. We have not used it for um, architecture and building and we're not using it for testing commissioning. So we've set it up for the main concrete works to see how to get it done. And then, I'll give you this in the PDF, 
But if it's done correctly, and that's a huge if, you can save time in the quantity takeoff if the models are built correctly. The problem becomes the architects don't want to model differently. The engineers don't want to model differently because it doesn't add any value to their workflow. It only adds value to the QS's workflow. So this is where collaboration and teamwork come into play. And there's no point in a QS building their own model. There are software vendors who I'm not going to name who are promoting the idea that QSs can build their own model from 2D drawings. Um, that is completely insane. That means that you're ending up with a completely other model of the project that's of only use to the QS and is not checked by the architect, not checked by the engineer. So it's impossible to determine if the cost plan is done or not. So if the model is not being used by the QS and a model generated by the architect for the design, you're all on a, you're all on a hiding to nothing. So be very, very careful about what model is used for this process. Um, it can add to levels of transparency, which is what people don't like. It can add to certainty in the budgets, but I've not seen that yet. And it can be used for value engineering in terms of design and construction, but it only works if you've got a very good model. So the last thing I'm going to talk about today in the last 15 minutes is um, data and data collection. And again, hammering on the same point. These are the people that are empowering our organization. David is our head of QAQC. This is John that you saw winning the award for the tunneling. These are the people driving our digital forms in the field. So we're trying to get rid of paper on the construction sites. And to do that, we're using a platform called FieldView. FieldView is basically a digital form system. So all of the following forms, sorry, it's a site management system. So it's for forms, it's for permits, it's for approvals. So we have deployed 132 tablets across 10 sites, and we have 1,500 users, including the main con, sub con, consultants, and the clients on this platform. And what we're doing is we're actually doing all of these inspections and form sign-offs digitally. So we've, we've removed paper from all these workflows. So all the safety inspections are digital. All the site reporting is digital. All the defects and issue management is digital. All the incident reports, digital. All the work permits, energy usage, work inspection, and work progress is all digital. So you can see the station numbers across the top, and you can see that they've assigned all these digital forms. So over the last 18 months, we have removed paper across the whole organization for all of these processes. And the reason we did that was to improve the efficiency of the guys on site. And it has worked immensely. If you need to fill in a form, you will do it on a digital device. It could be a device that we give to you, or it could be your own device, and we give you access to the platform. What it means is that all these forms get approved faster. It means that we never lose them, because we've, everybody has an experience of losing for paperwork, so we don't lose any paperwork. It doesn't get destroyed by coffee stains. It doesn't get eaten by the dog. It's all kept. It's all audited. So we've been very successful in improving our productivity on site and improving the speed out of, of efficiency of getting things done. What we have figured out is that we can now use the same technology for improving our project reporting. And we're starting to work on a process where we're actually using the forms and using data analytics to actually create project dashboards in real time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you one last video, which is the data analytics video. So this is a, a video capture of a um, dashboard. Now we're using IBM Cognos. You could use Microsoft BI, you could use um, any number of different software platforms. The data is being collected in digital forms on mobile devices on site. The data is then uploaded immediately into an Azure web service. And then using the data analytics dashboard, we're able to create reporting tools, whether they're safety reporting tools, whether they're manpower tools, whether they're resource tools. And we're working out and we're solving ways in which we can answer questions for senior management. So we're trying to figure out what's the question that is being asked by senior management? What do they need to know to make decisions about the project? Is it the rate of concrete pours? Is it the attendance on site? Is it the weather? What is it the actual questions they have? And then what data do we need to collect, either daily, hourly, uh, from remote devices that can generate these dashboards? So we are currently in what we would consider to be a research and development phase. We are seeing some very good signs in terms of how this is working, but we have still got a long way to go. So anybody who is sitting in your shoes, who is an undergraduate or who is not sure what the industry is gonna do in the coming 10 years, 
this is what the industry is going to be getting into in the next 10 years. And this is how you're going to secure your futures. We don't have anybody in our business that knows how to build data analytic dashboards. So we're learning and we're developing skills. And I've been given a mandate to develop a training program for data analytics and data skill sets to develop data literacy in Gamuda. So I'm the BIM guy, and now I'm tasked with improving the data literacy of all the staff in an organization of three and a half thousand people. And I'm figuring that out. And if you come back in a year's time, I might have some answers. But essentially, what we're trying to do is try and solve this problem. So we have to hand over data to our owners. So we've decided that we're going to use the field view system to collect the data. So this is the MRT data system. So in terms of the MRT, what we have to do is we have to capture information about all the products in the stations. So we have to know what product we're talking about, what system it's in, where it is in terms of space, and what station it's in in terms of entity. So what we've done is we've mapped out all of the things that we have to build inside a station. So we've given the station an entity classification. And then we've got all the spaces inside those stations mapped out. So whether it's the concourse space, whether it's a platform space, whether it's a control room space, and every par every space is given a classification. Now in Revit, we just use the room Revit rooms and we create that classification that way. We then have to make sure that the consultants and the subcontractors are putting all of their objects into the right system. So we might have a pump, sump pump system, we might have a fire sprinkler system, we might have a smoke evacuation system. We have a classification for all the systems and we need to make sure that all the consultants follow that. And then we get down to the actual components that are in those systems. So for every component, we have to track whether, whether it's a cooling tower, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we've done is we've basically used a, a system called UniClass, which is a UK based classification system. And we've used BIM to put all the classifications into the objects. So you can see that we've classified these objects. Now what's important here is we're not classifying and we're not collecting information for every single thing. We're only classifying and collecting things that we have to hand over as part of an o and system. So we're not handing over gigabits of data or terabits of data about bits of concrete or bits of pipe work or bits of ductwork. We're only handing over information about things that has to be maintained by the operator. So in this case, air terminals, devices, fixtures, equipment. And for every one of these things, we have a huge amount of data to collect. So what we've done is we've set up a system, if I go back a bit, so rather than the system of the uh, digital forms being used to just do reporting, we're going to use it to collect all the asset information on site. So we're, we're basically using the same digital platform on the same digital devices with the same site staff, and they're going to fill in, as the project goes, all the data required for the asset information model. So when you go back and look at that specification and you look at clause 9.3, all of this information, model spaces, the elements, the information, the asset ID, the description, the material properties, the geometry, all the ONAM information, all the shop drawing information, all the warranty periods and other essential information for asset management, we are going to collect that using digital forms on site. We're going to upload that information to a Amazon secure server, and then we're going to basically structure the information to give it back to the owners. So that is what we're currently doing in terms of a project that I'm working on. So here's the challenge that we all have to figure out. Um, in my opinion, and I'm not the only one, um, the shortage of competent digital consultants and contractors, and we don't train or develop enough people. So some of you guys picked this up earlier on some of the questioning. We need to do a better job of training people. My opinion, there should be budgets in every construction project for training, not something that may or may not happen. It needs to be mandated. And that training is not just going to a seminar and being told what to happen. That is project onboarding, that's on the job skills training, that's self-learning, that's peer-to-peer -peer sharing, that's e-learning platforms. And if you wanna learn Navisworks, we have an e-learning course for Navisworks, so you can use that. And there's discussion forums. All of these are learning. And I think that's gonna be a crucial part of the, the process. I'm not in a hurry to go anywhere. I can't, I can't leave my house. So if you've got questions, we can sit here all day and take questions, it's up to you guys. Okay, so first question, who's responsible for checking the models? We have a two-stage approach. First, first person responsible for checking the model is the person that created the model. So very often we find that people have made some pretty fundamental basic errors in their modeling. So that gets sent back. And then the second line of defense is the BIM managers team. So we have a team at the construction site, which is basically a BIM management team. 
they don't do modeling per se. They do BIM management checking. They go through the models and they check them. And we use tools like Celebri. So what we do is we run checks to make sure that things are named correctly, set up correctly. Um, and then we actually start looking at the models and seeing how they model things correctly. But essentially, if it's at different stages, it's different people. So if it's at a design stage, the designers should be looking at the models. If it's at a construction stage, the contractors should be looking at the models. But you need to have senior people looking and checking the models, particularly if they're driving a lot of processes. Uh, second question, you mentioned about the database running separately from the model, as the model shouldn't be holding all the information. How do you do that? Work breakdown structure and classification codes. So every element in the building has been named in accordance to the work breakdown structure and classification. So if the model has got the right management and the consultants have been trained correctly, they can put a parameter into every element that we can then link back to their database. So in our case, we're going to use two codes to make sure we've got a deliberate link. We're going to use the classification code and we're going to use the asset tag identification code. And we're going to use those fields in the model and we're going to use those fields in the database to link back between the two. So we're basically putting a code in the model and a code in the database to be able to link them. Um, will it be a problem if they're running separately since they don't sync with each other? We don't want them to sync with each other. So we, what we're doing is in the model, let's say we have a pump in a model that pump will have some design information. So let's say it's gonna have a pump capacity, it's gonna have an energy rate capacity, it's gonna be attached to a certain system, it's gonna be, uh, maybe it's got a certain brand. Those bits of design information will get put into the field view form that have to get verified by the subcontractor. So all the design information that, that has to be checked will get pushed into the forms and it will get checked and signed off by the subcontractor. And if they change that, that gets updated in the record that's in the database. And what happens is that the model becomes a 3D reference placeholder, but the verified as-built data about the actual pump, whether it's, its flow, its energy consumption, et cetera, et cetera, is the database. It takes precedence. So basically, you again have to train people to understand that the model is a physical, is a digital representation of the physical object, but the data for that model is in the database separately. Um, so they don't sync, they're kept separate. So I hope that answers the question, Ellie. For a binding effect of this client specification when it comes to the contract, if so, with clause 4.13, if it's not practical, wouldn't there be a dispute in progress payments? <laughs> and that specification is part of the particular specification and it is bound into the contract. Now, there is an understanding between us and the client that that specification is aspirational. We're currently, in negotiations with the client to write clarifications. And some of the issues that we've discussed and flagged up this morning will be clarified in a letter between us and the client. We wanna make sure the client is happy. We wanna make sure we give the client as much as we can, but we wanna make sure we're doing that within reason. We don't wanna spend 1% of the construction cost building models that nobody's ever gonna use. Um, and on that point, if anybody says BIM costs 1% of the construction project, tell me, give me a call. I'd love, to take, I'd love to take a piece of that money. That is a ridiculous amount of money. Um, so in my opinion, BIM should be zero. And I know that's not what's going to happen anytime soon, but if people are realistic, the amount of value that's in BIM and the amount of problems that BIM can save, the cost of running BIM should be zero. The reason people think it's a cost is they all see it as extra, extra, extra. They're, oh, we need BIM managers. Oh, we need BIM modelers. Oh, we need BIM coordinators. Oh, we need BIM this, BIM that. You don't need any of that. You got to go back and look at the current structure of the industry and make sure the architects can do proper BIM. The engineers can do proper BIM and the contractors can do proper digital construction management. And they're not adding in a whole bunch of new people that we don't need. Essentially, we need to focus on reskilling existing skill sets or existing trades in the industry to make them digitally competent. And that's what I'm doing now. For the analytical literacy training, you mentioned you, will you include coding and data science stuff in your program? Okay, so our program is gonna divide into three levels. So at the very upper level is uh, middle management to senior management. And what we want to train them on is how to define the dashboards that they want, how to, how to put the questions they want, and how to be able to actually look at and use data analytics dashboards. So anybody who's used them, you, can, you realize you can drill down into them, you can poke into them, you can do comparisons. So at the first level of training, we wanna basically get people comfortable using the dashboards. Then we've got a middle tier, 
which we're considering to be the guys who are going to do the data manipulation. So they are going to have to be trained how to do coding. They're going to have to be trained how to do data science stuff. So they're going to have to figure out how do I check data structures? How do I put different data sets together? How do I get under the hood of something like IBM Cognos and get it to do some clever stuff? How do I get it to call in data from different databases? How do I get it to write in web XML, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a middle layer of data scientists, which is going to be a very small number of people, but there is going to be a middle layer. And then there's going to be the guys who are collecting all the data and they're going to have to be trained how to collect it properly, efficiently, and make sure as, as much as possible the data is correct going into the forums. So the training of the guys on site will probably be easy because they've all seen it saves them time. So they're not going to be in any, they're not going to be an obstruction. Our biggest challenge is going to be training the managers, the project managers, the lead engineers to actually not request a PDF of a word and an Excel file of a report from what happened two weeks ago, but to actually be comfortable logging into a dashboard system on a web device with their boss sitting beside them and explaining what's happening on their construction project in real time using dashboards. So there is a layer of data science, there is a layer of coding, but we see that as the kind of the bridge between what happens on the site and what happens in the reporting. Oh. Uh, unless Unless most information is digitalized, it's hard to deploy data analytics. It's not a question. It seems local industry in Hong Kong still has a long way to go for digitalization strategy. Uh, I'll tell you what, Sean, it's not just Hong Kong. The entire planet has a long way to go when it comes to construction information. So our biggest challenge is silos um, and siloed information and silo behavior. So there is a lot of, most of our information, if we were honest, nearly all of the information we use for construction now is digital in some form or other. So the information for the most part is digitalized, but like I said at the beginning, it's unstructured, it's pretty much unformatted, and, and there's a lot of complicated language, but most people are keeping data in silos. So it's very, very difficult to start doing any kind of analytics if you're trying to do it on your own data only. You really need to have a open source data. And I will find the, there's a very interesting initiative going on in the UK right now. I will find the information and give it to Steve to share with the group but they're looking at a industry-wide data collaboration project in the UK. And I think that may be transformative in terms of how we structure and collect data. But you're right. It's the industry has a long way to go and it's not Hong Kong specific. It's not Malaysia specific. It is a global phenomenon we have to figure out, but people are aware of it. We've got CEOs of major construction companies asking every day of the week about IR 4.0 digital dashboards, IOT, everybody's aware of it but they're also aware of the problems of actually using it. So we'll see how it plays out. So Roman, thank you uh, very much for the, uh, the session today. You've uh, been here for over four hours now, and that's um, pretty impressive, uh, given that the, you're talking to an audience you can't see. So um, I'm used I to talking to myself, don't worry. <laughs> So just one, just one last thing. If you if you have any questions after the session, you can reach out to me. I put my email in the group chat. You can all you're all welcome to drop me an email. Um, and uh, hopefully, at some point, we get a chance to meet in in the real world. But if not, um, I'm always here to take questions. You can look me up on LinkedIn. You can look me an email, and I'll be always happy to take your questions. So stay safe, everybody. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, I've had as much fun delivering this as you've had listening. I'd like all of the students to. Um virtually uh, give Ronan a round of applause by raising your hands so that he can appreciate your um, the fact that you've appreciated what is said you can see those on the uh, oh brilliant yeah okay yeah there you yeah. go cool. so thank you very much indeed